a toast to the Anthropocene. And I think this is a really good uh, introduction for our, new, for our first guest of tonight, Sue Spade. Welcome to the stage. Sue Spade is an uh, American philosopher. Maybe I should sit here so I can watch my clock. And then um, if you oh, can. Have a seat? Yes, I think so. Yeah. But okay. Or we can stand maybe as well. Yeah, because uh, you will. Yeah, we I can will, stand. Yeah, because I will lead you to the. Um, I will leave the stage in a bit. So, Sue, you're an American philosopher, curator, and a writer, and you're based in Belgium. Why in Belgium? That guy over there. He imported me. <laughs> oh, that explains it all. Um, and you work as a curator, um, and you developed over 100 exhibitions, both in Europe and in the US. Um, and you started working with the notion ecovention, which is uh, joining actually the term ecology and invention. And um, this term now is far more common used, but you actually started it was using the term. That's true. It, uh, we coined it, in a girlfriend of mine, we were working on an exhibition in 1999, just before the millennium, and we saw that there were examples of land art that actually had a function, and we didn't really know how to address this because land art normally doesn't ever have a function. And so we wanted to have a little subset of land art that was different than the rest, that was somehow practical or functional. Yes, on this function, we will talk a little bit uh, later. Um, but in, your, in the um, uh, exhibits that you curate, you express, um, you present the work of ecologists, designers, and scientists who think about um, tackling and solving ecological problems. And tonight, you will present conceptual frameworks for the artistic practice and challenging, uh, challenges for the art world. Um, facing this Anthropocene. So the stage is all yours, Sue. Okay, I hadn't thought about doing this as a question, but does, before I start, does anyone want to guess, um, does anyone know what the population of the planet is these days? Throw out a number, one through 10. Eight, Eight. that's pretty close. And does anyone know what the population was in 1800? <coughs> one. So we're growing very fast, and um, it's actually my first slide, but it's actually more fun to do it as call and response. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to look at the population um, just very for one sec, because I think that you know the word anthropo is man, is humankind, human beings, right? And so I'm asking this question, can we homo sapiens ever escape the Anthropocene? And this question has many different, it can be understood in many different ways. Um, one is, will we solve the Anthropocene? Will we, will we, you know, one of the ways you might escape it is if you, if we get climate change under control and it no longer is risking to increase um, two degrees Celsius. But the other one is population control. And I don't think we're ever going to go back to one billion. I mean, that's going to be really something catastrophic. And I just want to point out one point about the um, the 2.5 and the 2.2. So basically, right now, each fa the average woman has 2.5 births per female, and we're going to slow that down a bit. And it's, that's the trend is to go to 2.2. But even by reducing our population rate, we're still um, going to increase by 20%. But anyway, this is not a birth control talk. It's just something to think about when uh, you're thinking about the Anthropocene, because in fact, we are the anthro, we are the anthropo. Okay, so um, to, I'm a member of a group called Permanent Questions, and all we do is ask people questions. So I'm not going to ask a, an infinite number. I have six on my mind right now. And uh, in my talk, the first three I'm just going to go over really quickly in slide form, and the, I'm going to focus more on the last four. But OK, so why focus on the Anthropocene? And um, one of the questions that Katrina asked you is, is the problem with the Anthropocene really capitalism? That is a, a, a lot of people say they, they call themselves either anti-Anthropocene or post-Anthropocene. Post, post and they argue, well, it's kind of ridiculous. It's not humans, it's capitalism. So that's one thing to think about. And uh, if you want to know all the different solutions to how to think about this, you can just Google TJ Damos resistance. And he has a whole paper on all the different things you can use to call 
all the alternative terms uh, to the Anthropocene. The second thing is, I asked myself, you know, she introduced me as someone who uh, organizes exhibitions of ecological artworks or ecoventions, and it's not really the only thing I organize, the only kind of exhibitions, but I know that there's escalation, and I asked myself, why do people actually think that organizing an exhibition about climate change or the Anthropocene is gonna have any value? What's the use? Like, uh, is it really just that there's a lot of artists these days working that way, and therefore we should have an exhibition, or are communities and trying to change the views of their citizens? So the question is, why are there so many new, why is there an escalation of exhibitions? The next, the third one, should artists have to do anything? That is a big question. Why should any of you guys who make things have to do something in particular that has a function that works on the Anthropocene? or that can contribute. Then the next thing is how could art positively impact the Anthropocene? With that, I will talk about ecoventions. So Katerina had told you that ecoventions, it's from ecology plus invention. But um, more particularly, I call it an artist-initiated practical action with ecological intent. So why do ecoventions work? What can we learn from eco-artists? What is ecological intent? And how does green design differ from eco-art? Can eco-art exhibitions be exemplary of green design? So those are the questions that, um, that seemed to be on my mind when I was invited to do this Anthropocene and artistic practices. So I don't expect anyone to read that. It's just a gauge. It's a chronology of exhibitions starting with 99, ending in 2017. And you can see there are more and more and more exhibitions on, the to on ecological topics. So it's not something I'm making up. Uh, in the early millennial, there were, you know, sort of a third as many. And 2017 looks short because I finished the book of, in May of last year, and there probably were another 10 exhibitions. But anyway, it just gives you a, a running tally. Uh, this is not anything I expect anyone to read. I'm just going to, I mean, using this as an example. So here's this debate. Should artists have to do anything? So you, it takes place, there's people there from Sweden, there's people there from England, there's people there from the States. A lot of people of France, uh, Nicola, if you guys have read Relational Aesthetics from Nicola Borio. Uh, so it's a, a bunch of people on the planet. A lot of them think that, uh, that this is too much of a burden. Artists shouldn't have to do things. In fact, the biggest criticism of artists having to do things is that artists are usually having to do things that the government should be doing. So if the artists do it, then that kind of gets the government off the hook. Um, anyway, so you can see I'm pretty much implicated in this debate. I cannot, I cannot escape the millennial debate. I, I've been playing a role in it since the very beginning because I've been doing so many exhibitions about actions and artworks that do something. So I just, bef I want to give you a picture in your head about what this ecovention term means because if we get going too fast, too far, and you're still like, what is she talking about? And you don't have an image, it won't be any kind of fun. So these are five um, examples, and for some reason I'm always working in a clockwise situation, which may be even more difficult. But so in the upper where one o'clock would be is a work by um, Mariettika Potrich and Ooz, where they took there was an oil spill right in the middle of downtown Brussels, and they uh, the company it was, I think it's British Shell they had tried to fix it and they had tried to. Uh, restore the land, but it, they didn't do a very good job. So they invited these artists to come and do it, and the artists brought plants and had an interesting strategy and and cleaned it up. But they didn't clean it up perfectly in the sense that humans were allowed to drink the water, but it was cleaned up well enough that, he, that animals could drink the water. Uh, on the bottom right is a grad from the famous PXL Mad, Veritons, and she did a, a, a rainwater harvesting system. And you can see she's taking the rainwater off the roof. You can see the pipe going through her system. And her water, this system cleans water um, better than any water treatment plant in all of Europe. So just by stacking up some well-chosen plants and running the water through, she's been able to make um, a, a new way of thinking about rainwater harvesting. And it could very well be in 30 years, every building in Europe is required to have a system like this on site. Um, at the bottom, you can't really tell what they're doing, but it's a kind of, it's definitely a, uh, it's a 
not a, it's a protest in favor of the of the water where the artist has worked with people and they've made these braids and they put them up all over the place to make bring attention to um, the river uh, on the lower left hand side is the world's first bicycle that cleans air when people ride it around it takes the um, the, the particles out of the air the it's like the diesel particulates for example and finally at the top is a, a beehive that's transparent and has actually held bees before and it is a really great tool for um, teaching people all about bee colonies because normally you can't see inside of a bee colony. So those are five examples and uh, all of them are Belgian except for uh, the bicycle, well, no, the one at the bottom is Polish and the one on the left is a, a Danish group, N55, okay. But that just gives you an idea. Artists, when I talk about practical actions with ecological intent initiated by artists, this is what I have in mind. Actually, artists working outdoors and coming up with a solution. How am I doing on time? You're okay. Okay. All right. So um, I just want to go over this really quickly. This is a criticism of why people don't want art artists to be doing things. As the criticism goes, artists who do the government's bidding are not only not free, free that is to pursue their preferred avenues of art making, but they are complicit with governments who outsource their responsibilities to artists or anyone willing to fix the problem. Thus, art loses on all fronts. Artists lose funding to make their best art. The government funds and rewards only art that fits its agenda. And art history plays second fiddle to community enrichment schemes. That's the criticism, but I want to really emphasize that these artists don't, they're not working for the government. They're either working for themselves or they're working, a lot of them, if you say, who's your client? They say planet Earth. That's who their client is. So when you take that into consideration, then you realize that, in fact, the criticisms of art that does something doesn't really apply for them because they are actually, um, they're not doing the government's bidding. They're doing what they think they should be doing. Okay, so I, I told you I'm partly to blame for these debates, but and uh, as Katerina said, I wear two hats, one as a curator and one as a philosopher. So I thought, you know, I ought to go at this in a more philosophical way. So I went, I, I gave you some examples of practical artworks, and now I want to talk about it in a little bit more philosophical way. So here's a question. It doesn't really seem as so relevant in Europe, as it does in the States, where we have lots of climate skeptics and people that don't believe in evolution. But the question is, why don't these people believe in evolution? Why are they climate skeptics? You know, can we reach them? That's a question. Another question is, um, how, does, how could artworks even reach these people? How can it influence them? Uh, no one really knows. One question is, uh, one, one thing I've seen a lot is that it does demonstrate the possibility for change. And when people are presented with change, they tend to think, maybe think differently. Uh, TJ Damas, he's a huge critic of this approach. He calls it rearranging the deck chairs on the sinking Titanic. So that's a different approach. And then finally, this is to me the most difficult question, is when you're making I, um, when you let's say you decide to make ecoventions and you decide to have planet Earth as your client and you decide to f to remedy a system in an innovative way, the question is beautiful for whom, why, and how, and that's I think one of the biggest questions that seems to be on Christoph's mind is that um, those people engineering the planet and trying to protect it doesn't seem to really have the planet's interest in mind. They seem to have humans' interest in mind. Ah, did I skip a Wait. Okay. So I want to tell you something about, um, I'm going to try to answer the first question because the first question, as I told you, was uh, why don't people believe in things? Like, is it just they don't have the right information? Well, more and more we're realizing that uh, it's not just simply information, education. It turns out that a lot of the people that don't believe are just as they know as much about the science as the people that do believe. Well, it turns out that um, there's something called cognitive states, and our perceptions are often influenced by beliefs and biases, all sorts of things we don't even necessarily know we have. And I, I give some examples here. Apparently, if I give you um, white wine that's been colored red, 
You'll drink it and it will taste like red wine. Uh, uh, so that's an example of um, some sort of cognitive state in action. Another example, um, and then of course, if you have certain beliefs, you're gonna see things differently than other people. So if you believe in climate change and you can see, uh, you, then you'll probably even notice it's getting warmer, or you'll notice that there's more storms, or you'll notice all sorts of things that other people are able to totally ignore. So, um, so that's one explanation, that because of cognitive states, we're not all perceiving the world exactly the same. Other people are perceiving it differently than we are, or the, the people that believe differently than we do perceive it differently. Okay, so I call this the cognitive states problem. And the reason I call it the cognitive states problem is because we normally think that if we can see something, other people can see it. But if we start to realize that we see the world differently because we have certain beliefs and we have certain desires and we have certain experiences and we have certain even, um, you know, it's if, if you know people that know every kind of species and they're walking around and this is a that and this is a that, you kind of think, gosh, I would have just ignored, I wouldn't have even noticed that tree, or I wouldn't have noticed that flower, I wouldn't have noticed that dog even. They all look like dogs, you know. But the more specific we are, the more, um, the more, we, the more aware we are. So the solution, um, rather than merely provide more information, getting non-believers to perceive certain mm -hmm. symptoms requires also devising strategies that address their values. So if this, Cognitive states problem is true. Information is not enough since beliefs tend to override scientifically proven facts. So uh, the reason this is relevant is because I've come to the understanding or I'm, I have a working hypothesis, let's say, that the reason why there's this push to have all these ecological art exhibitions these days isn't if people are doing it because they think people need more information, they're probably not going to succeed. If they're doing it because they understand that artworks operate on the level of values, and they challenge people's values, and they make people rethink their values, and they make people wonder what their values are, and if they make people um, just more... Con What's happening? I, I feel, Do we know what the time is? I know. I have 10 minutes left? Okay, great. I'm fine. I'm totally fine. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's the point. The point is that we have to be aware. The solution is to understand the artworks work on the level of values and that um, we just have to be aware of that so that we can think about values and think about. And it's also interesting to me that artists don't seem daunted by other people's values that are different than their own because they're really not trying to persuade people. So I think that's also another another prob probable explanation for the question, why do people think artworks can reach people? Okay, all right, this is my last um, slide with a million pieces of text on it, but I just wanna um, go over something that's also related to what Christoph was talking about. So uh, an American, well, a Japanese American philosopher named Yuriko Sato, she's argued that we have to appreciate nature on its own terms. And the question is, well, well how do we do that? What does it mean to appreciate nature on its own terms? Uh, so I try to argue that if we do appreciate nature on its own terms, we don't only not, we don't only take care of nature, but we notice nature when it's sick. Like just like if your friends are sick, you notice, you notice when they're sick, or your children, you notice when they're sick, and you try to figure out how you can make them better, and you try, you know, you take an action, you don't just go, oh, they're sick. So um, I have this something I call the kinship model, which really is trying to articulate the way humans are already in a relationship with nature, an ongoing, you know, where nature sustains us, we're part of nature, um, we owe something to nature, it's not just simply we, we should feel guilty about it, but we're in a relationship with nature, and that's what I call the kinship model. Okay, so I had the question, beautiful for whom, why, and how, and now I feel like I might be able to address this a little bit better. So the for whom are the actual beneficiaries or natural objects that stand to benefit by another evaluation of worth. The stakeholders, those are people who notice um, that nature is sick and want to try to figure out you know, how, how it's out of balance or how it could um, be more in equilibrium. And finally, um, stakeholders thus encourage practices that ensure outcomes in order to safeguard desired aesthetic properties. 
And one virtue of artist recommendations is that their strategies prove feasible. That's another thing that's simple, similar to what Christoph was talking about. He thinks we're going to go back to a period. But I think the period that we're going to go back to or that we're going to embrace is one where we are actors in our own environment and doing things, relying less on machines and relying less on uh, giant technologies that are distant from us. Maybe uh, Chris will have a different take on it, but that's the opposing view. Not the opposing, maybe complementary. Okay, so I gave you a lot of philosophical ideas and terms, but now I just want to give you a simple haiku that comes from Leopold Aldo, who's sort of um, one of the founders of, of, of ecology. And he says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So it's just a simple few words. But the point is, is that um, this probably even applies to your own designs and your own work that you do, not even just the biotic community. Now the biotic community, not Leopold or any other stakeholder, is designated the beneficiary for whom integrity, stability, and beauty are optimized, if not maximized. So the question is now, well, how do we optimize integrity, stability, and beauty? Let's see. OK, so one question is, what is ecological intent? So this is a, um, a sort of a debate between me and my husband. So Jean-Francois says that, oh, ecological intent, that's just respect for ecosystems, which is, I think, what uh, where also where uh, Christophe was going. And then I was thinking, well, you know, it's interesting. In nature, nature does. Well, it's not perfect, but it, it's not known for making waste the way humans are. So in a weird way, we know that um, uh, one indication that there's an equilibrium is that there's less waste. So it seems to me that ecological intent could be to just limit um, limit waste. OK, so uh, some ideas that are really simple, ecological strategies, whether art or design, optimize procedures that minimize the extraction, transportation, and processing of raw materials, including rainwater and bananas. Redeploy always streams so there are none. Reward regenerative agriculture, build natural infrastructure, and employ natural infiltration, maximize biodiversity. If you do this, you can also reduce energy consumption, produce carbon sinks, address flooding, and mitigate against climate change. OK, this is a lot to think about, but every one of us can take a part of this puzzle and contribute something. OK, so the future economy will require hydrologists, horticulturists, and citizens connected to nature to re-terra Earth. So that's just one example of what it could mean to, to have ecological intent. So now I just want to go through some quick um, examples of the ecoventions in more detail. Um, so again, most of these go clockwise. The CW means clockwise. Uh, so Lara Armosica, you might know her because she has worked a lot in this uh, in Limburg. She owns some landing. Well, she doesn't own it. She's sequestered some landing gank to keep it from being um, developed uh, and. The very blurry photo at the bottom is a book that she did, The Ruins in the Netherlands, where she went around uh, photographing, um, what do you call them? Photographing wastelands. And the one on the upper left is an image of a, from a performance in a forest. Well, where am I on time now? Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. OK, well, I better go. Well, how about this? I'm just going to go through the slides. And if anyone's interested, I can give you a PowerPoint. But you get maybe some pictures. Um, here are different artists who, so this is a whole category of valuing anew. So you can see artists are trying to make people think differently about um, the land. These are all the different biodiversity projects that, have, that are going on in different places. These are um, people working on uh, making their communities better, or uh, mostly urban infrastructure, because a lot of the time, a lot of ecological problems in the city are just simply that there aren't the um, facilities. Here are some giant reclamation projects for land, rest land restoration and reclamation, or water reclamation. Food security, I'm sure you guys are, know at least someone who's involved in urban farming. Climate change, mostly activism, but on the piece on the right, it's more than activism. They were able to communicate, they were able to convince um, people in the Netherlands to take land that had been farming land and then turn it into a wetland again and make it 
have a lake. That's what the, it's a before and after image. And this is um, Echoes, which is one of the, um, as a lot of artists are now working on ameliorating other people with the view that uh, part of the reason that everything is broken down is because even people feel broken down. And you can't really heal the earth if you need healing yourself. OK. Uh. All right, I think that um, I won't do justice to go through this so quickly, but um, I just want to make one point about design, the, the design projects and the ecoventions. So I don't know if you noticed this, but all the ecoventions that you saw, the artists have made them. So it's like the artists design both the alpha model and they test it, so the alpha and the beta. Um, but what's interesting about artists is a lot of times they drop it after that and they go to the next project. So um, eventually they give a lot of their ideas away. But I wanted to point, does any, has anyone heard about this land art generative in, initiator? This is a weird, um, this is, these are people that are, think that they're doing ecological green design. But in my mind, um, the, resource, the, resource, the level of resource exploitation is so intense, it's really hard for me to see this as either as green design. But anyway, I just brought this in case you guys are aware of um, this group. Well, it's not group. It's actually an international contest. They have a contest every two years. Um, they come, they choose a place, and then they ask designers to come up with uh, scalable models for um, these different communities. OK, so this is my last slide, I believe. Um, so green design engenders environmentally friendly products whose designs can be taught, improved upon, and applied broadly. Whereas ecoventures are typically prototypes, one-off solutions initiated by artists to redress a particular site's environmental issues, which they expect others, especially designers and ecologists, to eventually copy. That's kind of interesting, right? So these artists really want to be copied. And I, and I think to myself, well, that's interesting. Why do they want to be copied? But they want to be copied because they always want to move on to their next project. And they're hoping that um, you know, they'll inspire someone else to take up some of their ideas. Um, my worries. Too often, green design presents attractive, though largely unusable and resource intensive products. There needs to be more emphasis on renewable materials and collaborating with landscape architects to build natural infrastructure. Green design owes a greater fidelity to truth than ordinary design, since it is meant to do far more than mere window dressing. That's another thing. Sometimes when we see ads for green design in the newspapers and the magazines, you look at it, you're like, huh, I don't even really know that that can do what it promises to do. But in a weird way, it seems that green design ought to be truer. Like it, it ha It's making commitments to having the planet as its client and doesn't really go that far. All right, so green design stands to do far more long-term damage should their outcomes not live up to their promised functions. All right, this is, again, not supposed to be um, something you read, but it, in the catalog we just did, uh, we had a sustainable printing manifesto. We'll do this and no to this and yes to that. And then in the last very blurry pages, the designer actually did a self-analysis to see whether or not all the decisions he made had contributed to the ecological um, to make to making the catalog more ecological, because you could argue that having a catalog itself is pretty unecolog pretty unecological, right? But um, it is a print on design catalog, so it's not like there's thousands of them sitting in storage somewhere. Uh, and then uh, some of the innovations. Well, I don't know if they're innovations, but some of the options. So you, shipping locally, email globally. I mean, these days you can email a lot of artworks that you couldn't have done a couple years ago. Uh, we just saw a show in Spain where everything was framed, but the art, but nothing was shipped. It was genius. So she had gone to like some sort of frame warehouse and then printed everything to fit in her frames that she had on hand and then framed everything up. And then after the exhibition, she can reuse her frames. I thought that was a really interesting idea. Another ecological thing that no one ever thinks about is space utilization. Not, I mean, okay, not having lots of empty space, using your walls, using, I mean, this is something I think about a lot is how do we, um, you know, how, how, do, how do we be more ecological with space? And then of course, um, using the collection. Anyway, there's loads of ways that ecological exhibitions can be more ecological, even though lots of people say, 
an ecological exhibition is a juxtaposition in terms because any exhibition, anyway, you don't have to paint. You can use pre-existing walls. Thank you, Al. Okay, that was really quick. Thank you. We can have a seat. Thank you so much. Wim, ah oh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, lots of teams, actually lots of super interesting subjects passed um, in your talk that we, I think we can talk for hours about. Um, but maybe my first question is, um, you already mentioned this, but um, to select an artist to curate, um, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, does the artwork need to work in a certain way? Like, does it have to, for example, eh, the, the customer Mother Earth, does she have to be um, made better by the artwork? Is that like the criterion you use? Well, I, th the, I think the criterion would be that the artist intended to do something. Okay. Because there are artworks that fail. I mean, these artwork, I mean, these are not a lot, a lot of, most of them these days work with scientists, so they're not just on their own, but there is a chance that um, it won't work the way they think it will work. For example, I don't know if one of the images I showed you was um, from Melchin's revival field, which he worked with a scientist, and they tested 96 different kinds of plants to see which, um, which ones would bring metals up. Mm -hmm. They had no clue whether it was going to work or not. They, they had 96 different tests going on, and it turned out it worked really well, and now, they're, now it's a, like a a billion dollar, 400 million dollar business or something. But anyway, not for the artists, but for the people that copied. But I'm just saying, there are loads of examples of works that fail as science, but work as art. Exactly, and that's the boundary, let's say, the well, idea that's, and, and... That's also the safety. I mean, that's one of the reasons why these artists can take more risks, is because um, they don't have the same l limiting parameters as scientists might where scientists really can't fail. I mean, well, if they fail, they just don't tell anyone. But, um, <laughs> you know, they keep it a secret, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I think you also mentioned this. So artists leave their work behind maybe just at the moment it could start working. Do you have examples of artworks that work now? That, um, well, let's that do take, something in let's the Let's take the example of N55. They're the ones who invented the bicycle, the air cleaning bicycle. Exactly. So if they really were like inventors, they'd be like, oh my God, we got our genius idea. They go to the patent office, they get it patented, and then they like have a prototype and they go to the manufacturer and they say, here, this is something you can make a billion dollars with, you know, design it, sell it, market it. But instead, they put all, if you know anything about N55, they put all of their designs on the internet. It's all uh, in the commons. And, and they really want everyone around the world to make their designs. Just give them credit. You know, Don't say, I designed this, but say, I built it. So I think that's a way a lot of them work. A lot of them are, um, you, they're ter it's not that they're terrible business people. N55 have so many designs that they can't really turn everything into a business. It wouldn't. Um, it wouldn't be fun for them. It's much more fun for them to, to do a design, test it, put it out there, and see people use it, and then see another problem, and then address the next problem. Mm -hmm. So idealism is a major part. Also, I don't know, but these people are idyllic. They're they're more practical than idyllic. Pragmatic, maybe. Yeah, because I would say, like. Giving your your ideas away is idyllic. Is no, idealist? Wouldn't it be? I don't because know. you could make a lot of money with it, for example, right? No, I'm is not against idea. I just I think we use idealism differently. Okay. Than, um, idealism in the way like that you are uh, trying to make the world better. Um, okay, if that's the definition of ideal. Listen, then they're idealists. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think that they're just simply trying, they all work on a very low level of resources. Mm -hmm. And and I think they're just trying to try things rather than to have some agency. You know, artists, that's one thing that is really special about artists is they do have agency. They're used to 
uh, like for example, I, I noticed when I wrote my book on artists who farm as art, that in a weird way, one of the reasons artists make such great farmers is they're incredible observers. You know, they're used to observing, they're used to staring at something for like four or five hours, you know, drawing from still life. So they're, they're really good at observing. They can work on tedious projects. They can work on things alone and they can problem solve and they're systems oriented. All these things really, um, I think art school trains people differently than like even going to ag school, agriculture school, mm -hmm. or engineering school. And or design school? I don't know. I'm not, I can't speak for design school mm -hmm. because I think that probably design school is going to be closer to an art school than uh, where you, you do. Um, I think the designers would have agency as well. Yeah. So also to talk about schools, you, you, um, today you were at a school? Yes, I spent the day at... Uh, Pierre Salmad. Yeah. I don't know how to say it. That's how I say it. How do you say it? I wouldn't. Big so. Nomad? <laughs> okay. So are there any students here? Um, yeah. Yes, that you saw today, right? I don't know. I can't see anybody. <laughs> so, but... Um, you must have to ask, did anyone see her? Yeah? Did anybody see? Yeah, Sue? Yeah, I see one hand. Um, but my question is, actually, do you see that the young generation or the people you saw today are they interested in the Anthropocene? Do you see... Um well, that's a good question, because there were three artists who are definitely dealing with landscape and definitely dealing with... Uh, and one guy said, well, well, I used to be a Boy Scout, which I, I often think to myself that Belgium's commitment to the Scouts, it should be the number one uh, environmental country in Europe. There is no country with more Scouts. But strangely, I've never seen a correlation between the Scouting. Like the people, be, as soon as they turn 18, they stop Scouting and they stop thinking about it. But anyway, uh, so, so I would love to be able to channel that energy somehow. Anyway, but so he talked about Scouting and landscape, but he couldn't figure out, he never would admit that he was focus on the landscape. I don't know if that's because he didn't think he could. Uh, there, were an there was another one. So, so, uh, um, so the focus in nature is somehow impractical as well, you think? For, is there like some kind of boundary that artists have to cross before they, they um, use nature as their subject? Well, I think that truthfully, um, there's very few artists who do it. Who Well, most of these artists were painters at one point. Uh, or and some of them are sculptors, but something happens in them that they um, they want to go outside and they lose interest in the studio practice. Okay. So to get back to your question, today everyone I visited has a studio practice. So we we saw one work that was outdoors, but it was a billboard. It was, a, um, but I think it's the kind of. But Vera Tons went to Pixel Mad, and she had been doing all this research before she met me. And um, she was already working outdoors. So I th it's maybe something that happens when, I don't know. An interaction with the world, perhaps? So well, I think they have to know about how the, the, the art exists. And I, don't ever, I never ask Vera how she discovered. Tuan, are you here? Oh, Vera is the, the, the lady who does agriculture, actually, right? But she was yeah. She was the one who did the um, the rainwater treatment. Oh yes. Her son told me he was going to come. Yeah. Vera, Twan, are you here? No, he didn't come. Anyway, okay. her son. I ran into him today, and he said, "Oh, I'm going to come to your talk." So he might be able to tell us how Vera discovered ecoventions. But mm -hmm. um, it's not taught in art history. This is a problem. I mean, this is this is a huge problem. Uh, it's difficult to find out about this kind of art because it's, there's very few art historians that work in the field, and you're certainly not going to get a job as a curator at a museum. If you, if you do your PhD on ecoventions, I don't think any museum is going to hire you because they're not really in the business of commi commissioning this kind of work either. So it's difficult to find out about it unless you... I don't know, I don't know how people find out about it. Yeah. True talks like this one, I guess. I hope so. Yeah. To make a little bridge to our next uh, speaker, actually, our title is Dark Ecology, but that is a term you specifically don't use, right? Why not? Well, um, I think that I want to believe that ecology or ecosystems are already really complex and... Um, they're not idyllic. This is I-D-Y-L-L-I-C. So they're not 
they're not pure, they're not innocent, they're not, uh, I think that the reason why people started evoking dark ecology is they wanted, they wanted to somehow provoke people to think differently about the ecology. But for me, I already have this, I want to present an image of the ecology as not necessarily something that can be in balance, not necessarily something that has an equilibrium, but something that we can potentially um, manage it, not manage the equilibrium, but be more con cognitive of it and see what is causing it to be out of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is that um, a lot of the people focused on deep ecology, um, they come out of the genre of horror, and the genre of horror is really popular in film, and it gets only more, every year there's more and more horror films, and uh, one of the products of the horror genre in the visual art world is something I call catastrophe art. So you see, um, you know, everything is like ap apocalyptic or it's just, it's not that it's negative, but I think that it does, you look at it and you go like, oh, that's scary. Well, there's a danger, an inherent danger in yeah. nature? Or? No, well, though, I'm just talking about the, the either the horror genre mm -hmm. or the catastrophic genre. Mm -hmm. So it's either a cathartic process, but it doesn't really get, you don't leave thinking like, oh, I can make a difference or I could do something differently. You just leave thinking, oh, it's really scary or that's scary fun, that's scary entertaining, that's scary, you know, you know what I mean? Scary, it doesn't, it's more gets you on an emotional level, but again, it, it leaves you frightened. And I, do, I, want, I want to empower people and have them imagine that they can do things differently if they just um, have a different approach. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I don't know if, did anyone see the movie Demain that was really popular two years ago? What movie? It was called Demain, en français. Demain. Demain. No? Oh, yeah. Okay. One, yeah. Okay, so that movie, I think, was really... In, I mean, no one, I think it was the biggest success in Belgium, probably more than any other country in Europe. But one of the reasons why it was so popular is it really gave you specific examples of things people are doing all around the world. And it made you think, oh, I want to be part of that. It didn't, it didn't make you think like, oh, well, if they can do that, they do that there, but we would never do that here. Mm -hmm. It made you think, oh, I might be able to rethink how I have my community. And is that how other people felt? Not really. The one person who saw it? Yes. Yeah. An empowering film, Demand. So don't you agree? It's a little different to see Demand, which is empowering, than to see some movie about like a natural disaster where everyone drowns and one person survives and they're living a miserable life by themselves or something. I, mm -hmm. I, I really... So maybe I think we, we uh, have to close off. Can we have one more question from the audience, perhaps? Okay, let's see. Is there any, are there any questions we can also, uh, oh yeah, there is one question. I'm curious about, um, uh, you, you already mentioned it a little bit, but um, how do you see the role of uh, science um, in relation to art and in relation to ecovention? How do you say the role of science in relation to art and ecoventions? Okay, so um, more and more these artists are really working with scientists from the very beginning. And a lot of them are only interested to do the project if it can be proven to have a scientific effect. So for example, in uh, Finland, there's a place called uh, Halakad Lati. Lati is Finnish for lake. And it used to be a water treatment plant and it was filled with like oils and chemicals that had been used to treat the water. And then somehow the government decided, that, oh, we want to have it as a, fish, a waterfowl or a fish, a, excuse me, a bird sanctuary. So the artist is like, hmm, now what can I do? So she started working with biologists, and she built three artificial islands, two as habitat, and one particularly to, to, for birds to, um, for feeding and spawning. And it's very important to her that the scientists can tell her, well, she's now deceased, but 10 years ago when she was doing it. It was very important that they were on from the very beginning. They advised her about the plants. They advised her about blah, 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 all the details. And then they can say, oh, yes, we do get this many birds coming here. We do see a transformation of the landscape. We do see. So it's a lot of these artists are really, uh, there was a, there's a meadow in Liverpool that was originally a blue flower meadow next to a yellow flower meadow. There were like two patches. So the artist hired also, well hired, 
but they probably worked as volunteers. But they got in, they got some uh, biologists to do species counts, and they were able to see, like, oh wow, isn't that interesting? These insects prefer yellow flowers, and these ones prefer blue flowers. But that kind of a test had never been done because no crazy person ever thought to make a blue meadow next to a yellow meadow. You know what I mean? That this is something an artist would think, oh, I want to have these two different square meadows. And I want to see what, what it will do and how it will work. And it's the same thing a lot with the, um, the urban beekeeping. A lot of the urban beekeepers around the world, which is hugely popular, a lot of it is started by artists. And, um, and now the scientists are doing, are working their biodiversity studies around, they're very influenced by um, the beekeeping movements in the cities. So it's just, it, the science plays a huge role, partly because the artists want to be legitimate. They're not doing it for fun. They're doing it because they have a, an idea that they want to test and they want to test it proper. They want to go about the um, experiment as, as, as best they can. Um, I'm sorry, maybe we can, maybe we can, sorry, Reed, I think we need to proceed uh, to our next uh, speaker, but I think we can talk for hours, so maybe you can uh, meet each other at the bar again. So, Sue Spade, thank you so much for this. Oh.